I met Jason Stewart about two years ago. We were in an exercise group in the park nearby during COVID. Had to get out in the park and exercise and recreate. Anyway, I knew that he was a stand-up comic, but what I didn't know is that he was such a prolific actor. He's been in a ton of movies and a ton of TV shows. I mean, his credits are like this long. It's really great. Anyway, he came in and we, uh, we had a great conversation. Very interesting guy. One of the things he did is he came out as gay on uh, Geraldo's show years ago. That's kind of unique. He's a great guy. We had a lot of fun and I really like him. I think you're going to like this episode. Wilkinson here. Today my guest is Jason Stewart. Who is Jason Stewart? Well, for starters, he's a character actor, a stand-up comic, a writer, a director, and a lecturer. What did I miss? Um, occasional host, a okay. son, a lover, <laughs> uh, oh, a good friend. We'll have to get into some of that. Anyway, tell my people hi. Hey, everybody. I'm glad to have you here. It's, I'm glad I've, to be here. I've known Jason for, what, a couple of years, maybe? We were in an uh, yeah. exercise group exercise together. Exercise class, yeah. Yeah. So let's start out. So how did a Jewish boy from the Bronx get to be such a prolific character actor and stand-up comic? How how that happened? I guess what I tell most people is my dad was a Holocaust survivor, and he came here in 1949. And through osmosis more than what he actually said, he used to say to me, when you go to the interview, you wear a tie, and you tell them you mean business. And I took that to mean to be your best self always. And that's what I strive to be. He taught me to show up in life. And he's since passed away, um, I think 11 years now. Wow. And next month it'll be 11 years. And he taught me how to show up and complete tasks through his own ability just by watching him and how he continued over and over and over to succeed because he just kept showing up. And he came to New York City from... From Poland after okay. the Holocaust. He wasn't in the camps. He was in the ghettos like Adrian Brody and the Pianist. And that's the best reference. He lived in all sorts of places. So that's part of who I am always. And your mother was a My New Yorker? Brooklyn girl. Okay. You know, very poor. How do they meet? Do you know? At a dance. Really? Yeah. In the 50s, that's the way people met was at dances. They went on a double date. And with other people, they were with other people. And my father wanted this cute, you know, sexy, voluptuous uh, 17 year old. And so did he, she impressed him right away, like boom. Well, my mother was very, you know, she would talk like this. And if you wanted to talk to her, you had to work harder. She really liked this other guy who was an Italian guy that was, or a Jewish, you know, maybe a Jewish mafia guy, somebody like that's a bad boy. And she really liked him and she was waiting for him to come back in town. So she just dated him occasionally. You know, whenever he called, because her boyfriend there, the guy she really liked, wasn't in town. So how did he beat him out? Uh, she got pregnant. <laughs> oh, that with you? No, you're a middle child, My right? brother. Yeah. My okay. brother, yeah. Okay. Huh. Like a lot of women did in the 1950s. You know, it changes your life. You know, it changes the, it changed the trajectory of who she was as a person. And I think it cut her off from becoming whoever she was going to be, become. But And that's what's so important about abortion issues, I think, because it has to be something you want. So you were born in New York. I was born in New York. When did you come out west? Uh, when I was a little under a year, we moved to California. My father was a very big macha in the uh, clothing industry, especially uh, specifically neckties. And he learned to cut ties really fast. And that, that with the system, I guess, and that, that got him a job in California. And then he moved to California. We drove here in his, in his Chevy. It was green with a yellow top. And my brother was, I think. Well, wait, what year Chevy do you know? Any idea? I don't remember. I think some some in the 50s, you know, people didn't buy new cars all the time then. And we lived here. And uh, my father, it didn't work out for the people we moved to. Then he went to work for another place called Castle Netwear, Neckwear. And he was there for probably 35, 40 years. Yeah, and he, became, he started being a tie cutter. And then he went to the manager of the department and then vice president and then part owner. People don't do that anymore. He was the American dream. But keep in mind, for Jews, when they came here, there were other Jews that would help them. Their roots were not cut off. Like in the black community, there was nobody to help because there was nobody going up. So we were very lucky in that way. And my father taught me a great work ethic. 
he was very much a big influence on me in my life in terms of how I handle myself. And my mom also is the influence because my mother was very funny and very sexy. And I, I dedicate my book to her. And I said, my mom taught me how to get a guy. She just didn't teach me how to keep him. <laughs> huh. Is your mother still with us or no? My mom lives next door to me. Hashtag, I do not live with my mother. <laughs> she lives next door. Okay. Is that in a condo or something or what? Yes, we yeah. live in a, an apartment complex and I live upstairs and she lives downstairs in one over. That stands, that's like a big, a big L for loser because that's what I am with men. I'm a big loser. Oh, come on. No, I am. It's, it's pretty consistent. <laughs> oh, you've had a partner at some point? I've had a number of them. Oh, you're gay? Pardon me? <laughs> you're gay? I'm only gay on the weekends. I okay. can't be gay every day. <laughs> All right. It's too hard. All right. Well, speaking of gay, so I was watching an old clip of uh, Geraldo. Oh, my God. And you came out. 30? So I have a couple questions about that. One of them is there was a woman, I'd say she's a little over middle-aged. Looked like Shelly Winters, right? She was the one that was saying you shouldn't be kissing in the Right. Public. That woman looked that, just like Shelly yeah, Winters, yeah. I thought. So, oh, yeah, yeah. Now I see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 She yeah. had that sweater on with the, right. yeah. So what was her problem? <laughs> <laughs> what was her problem? Yeah, I was like, come on, lady. Well, I think you forgot. That's what happened. Right. When, when you watch this, it's it's. this is my 30th anniversary now. And I didn't watch the whole show, right. I don't think. Like, I wasn't able to see the Somebody whole had put that clip together and sent it to me, and it's on my website. So if anybody wants to watch it, you go to okay. jasonstewart.com, and you can watch it in the uh, video and then go to interview. Okay. But um, So people can uh, see what we're talking about. But what's really interesting about that is that you, as a gay man forgot that's why you're asking me this question and this is i love this i love that we can oh, talk I know. about I, this i didn't forget i'm just asking what what was your problem it how it unfolded but that no that's the way people were in those days i think we do forget because it's so open now and everything is we live in palm springs and it's really cool it's very gay it's very show business you know the idea of two men being intimate in any way whether it be a kiss hello the, the, for those at home the question was it was it was sort of distorted because Geraldo was trying to sort of wrangle her because she was like all over the place. She just this idea, all the she said, well, the kissing and the hugging and the way you guys touch. And I said, when your husband comes home, do you kiss him hello? And she said, yes. And I said, well, why don't I have the same right to do that? Why do I? Why is that considered sexual when you're just kissing someone hello? And she went, oh, and she couldn't really get that through her head because the idea of gay people having or LGBTQ people having the same rights as straight people in 1993 was completely foreign country. And even now, there's well, some now people, I think they're trying to turn it back for sure. They are, but they can't. Not well, with, not I, with. I hope not. <laughs> I hope so too. But they, they, they can try to turn it back. But the people are not, the younger people, especially today, are not going to put up with that. And it won't turn back in the same way. It'll be a, you know, some sort of civil war. I think, it, and it, it's already starting a civil war in yeah. this country. We're already separated. It wouldn't surprise me if this country was split into two places. In a way, I wish it was. Like the whole southern part, they can be their own Just country. state by state. You know what I mean? You want to have your own thing. You can have your own racist state by yourself. Just stay there and leave us alone. You know, we'll take, you know, uh, hmm, Washington State, Oregon. We'll take New York, of course, <laughs> Chicago. And, you know, and uh, maybe, of course, California and a couple others. And then they can have all the things that we don't have to worry about anymore. Let them stay there, let them work there, let them live there. And we don't have to cover them and be a part of that anymore. That sounds like a cool idea. I don't think it'll happen. No, of course not. So getting back to that woman, did you move her at all? Do you think in that interview or not? I think she had something to think about. I okay. wonder whether she's alive now. I'd love to contact her. I don't know how I would do that, but that would be sort of cool. I never thought about it until this moment. Wow. Well, hmm. So my other question on that, after that interview with, with him, did that how did that affect you professionally when you basically came out? You you had said a few people knew, some people knew that you were gay. But as a professional, what didn't you come out on that program? I came out on that show. I did right. stand up. It was a show called Unconventional Comedians. They didn't really talk about my acting career. It was more about my comedian career. And uh, the show was built around me. I had sent a press release through fax to all the big talk <laughs> shows of the day wow. that my friend Marcy Smolin had helped me write. And... The biggest show right at that moment was Phil Donahue. Second biggest show was Geraldo. Third was Oprah. Fourth was Sally, Jesse, Raphael. That's a hard name. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Sally had called, and so did Geraldo. But we took Geraldo because it was a bigger one. And we created, we asked all these people to be on it. And oh. I did stand-up, and I 
uh, was interviewed and it changed my entire life. What, how did it change it? Uh, I was able to be me without having to apologize. And if you see on the show, I watched it recently for some reason, I can't remember why. I was really ready. You could see I was ready. It was very scary. There was no Ellen, there was no Rosie, there was no Ricky or Elton Mm. or Billy Porter, you know, all these people that are out now, there was none of them. Uh, I was out there by myself. A lot of people told me not to do it, specifically. They said it would ruin your career. Oh yeah, and it did ruin part of my career. Which part? Um, the idea of being not a joke to some people. Um, in retrospect, 30 years later, you think about all the things that one misses by not lying, but then you think about all the things you gain and it's really exciting. I got to be who I am. Mm. I got to talk about who I am. I got to work with some incredible people in the LGBTQ world that were movers and shakers. I was asked to be a part of stuff. And I was able to show up for my LGBTQ brothers and sisters. And I was able to raise up the ones that came before me. And there's so many that nobody talks about. Robin Tyler, comedian and activist. Uh, Kay Clinton, uh, Michael Greer, who's passed. Bruce Valanche hmm. was the first person I ever saw at an AGA meeting. That was a, a alliance of gay artists. And I was a closeted member where you weren't allowed to use my name. And he was the first time I'd ever seen anybody who was in show business talk about being gay in the same breath. It changed me and it made me a better comic and it made me a better actor because I had my feelings were more available. I was more available and I became the go-to guy in the 90s to work on sitcoms as the funny gay guy, which morphed into the funny manager guy, prissy manager or uptight which morphed into my annoying Jew characters, uh, which morphed into my villain characters, which morphed into the actor that I am today. So which do you prefer? Do you have a favorite as far as, is it stand up or is it acting or what? Oh, I'm an actor first. That's my roots. That's who I am. Comedy happened because I couldn't get a job. I was told to my face by very, very well-known casting directors that I would not work. Because you're too gay or something. They or didn't what? use those words in those days. You what were too, they, they too light in your loafers. Um, <laughs> really? Your slip is showing. You need to change the way you move, the way you walk. They're going to tag you. I was always afraid that somebody was going to fire me. And they did. I got fired a lot. Really? Oh, yeah. I was fired off a very big sitcom in the um, mid-2000s, the aughts. And... Uh, I was playing a gay character who was a manager of a boutique of some sort, a clothing store. I had two scenes and I did the table read and everybody laughed. And then we did the the uh, run through for the network. Which we did it a day early, which was odd. And people weren't laughing as much. And I thought, God, what happened? And the next day I found out I was fired. So were they kind of testing you by doing it a day I early? I don't know. Do think, uh, I can tell you what I do know is that I was up against... Rip Taylor, all these, Alec Mappa, oh God, the redhead guy, I'm losing my mind. I love him, he's so good. All these wonderful gay actors. And I got the part and I was very, I couldn't believe it. It was a network show. And at the time it was, uh, I guess, should I say, I'm, I'm hesitating because I don't want to say, it was, it was called Less Than Perfect. And then I heard years later through one of the producers, I won't say her name, that somebody had a bug up their butt, basically, that they didn't want a gay guy playing this part. And the only person who called me was Sherry Shepard, who's an old friend, a comedy friend of mine. She called me and told me, we don't know what happened. You know, it's not you, honey, it's them. And I'll never forget her for that. I Mm. was mortified. That was probably the biggest, getting fired from a really big job. They paid me off. And then Will Sasso played the part like a macho kind of hunky, burly kind of guy. So, <laughs> sort of. Wow. And I watched it, I remember. And there are, there, there are reasons that certain recur- recurring roles didn't go longer because some people didn't want a gay character to take over or they didn't want somebody really funny maybe or they didn't like the idea their character was being told what to do. So the parts were kept small most of the time in those days. I had 10 different producers who wanted to do series with me. Not one of them could get it off the ground. 
Really? Yeah. For over probably, a, mm, I'd say, a 10 to 15 year period. The only person I know who was a gay man who got a series deal. Oh, this redhead guy. I can't keep I'm, his name is going to come to me. This happens when you get over 50. It was Mario Cantone. He had a deal and it never got made. Hmm. He was supposed to play twins, a straight and a gay. And most of the time when they would have gay characters on television who were in a couple, it was always a gay man and a straight man, almost always. And I quote Harvey Milk always when people ask me about that. Ooh, a gay guy in power. That's scary. Yeah, really. <laughs> and that, that would mean that we'd have opinions and we, right. in, on how something should be played and what was real and what wasn't real. But God, things have changed so much now. Now gay men are playing gay men everywhere. It's really wonderful. Uh, we still have other things to deal with, bias certainly of what we can play, and that we have the same opportunities as our straight counterparts. Yeah. So what's your take on, I mean, I've heard some people say, if there's a gay character, it should be played by a gay. Do you agree with that or not? Well, that's a complicated, it's not a short answer. As an artist, I want to play everything. I have played everything. I played everything from a plantation owner to the husband of a gay guy that just had a young child. So for me, I would love to be able to play everything and it shouldn't matter. Now you'll hear casting directors, writers, directors, or producers say, well, we want to hire the best person for the role. I don't think that's really possible because there's bias where we decide where certain people should go. If you see somebody, I'll use Tom Hanks as an example. I went to an award show once and he was getting an award for being for you know his whole career achievement award and they called him the everyman well why is he the everyman what makes him that i don't know tom H uh, hanks very well i don't know much about him other than he's been married twice he's got two sets of kids he has two academy awards he's uh, been ha he's had the most incredible opportunities i don't see him as an everyman but because he's white he's christian appearing he's attractive he gets to be the every man. He gets to be everything. Not that he doesn't deserve it. He's a brilliant actor. Right. I love watching him. But what makes him the every man? Why am I not the every man? So that's the way I say that. The playing field is not even. I don't have the, the career in my 20s and 30s that a lot of my counterparts did in order to be able to have a bigger career now. I have to wait in line still. I still have to compete in a different way. When you see someone like Damon Wayans, I was on My Wife and Kids for a couple of years with him. I had a recurring role playing The Shrink on the show. And he's we're similar in age, similar uh, careers in terms of um, time, but he'll be offered stuff. And he had his own shows and I was guesting and doing recurring roles or co-stars. And I was headlining all over the country, mainstream clubs. He was doing theaters and bigger things. He was getting much more money than I ever could ever think of making, hmm. but he's handsome and he was able to go past the, and incredibly funny, he was able to go past the race w wall right. as a black man, but he still had a, the opportunity to have a better career. Probably not the best uh, person to use, but just because I know him, we were on the show together. A lot of people like that had more opportunity because they were straight. And these are people, Drew Carey, I started out with. He was so kind to me. I remember once he paid me $1,000 to write just a couple jokes for his book. And oh, he, really? And he gave me my second guest star job in 1994, I think it was, or five on the Drew Carey show. I, I had done one, I was, one when I was 19, and I hadn't done one since. Wow. And uh, he was really terrific to me. Um, there was, you, you know, a lot of gr wonderful people uh, really helped me out in my career. I've been very lucky, but I showed up and I learned that I, if I want to play straight people uh, in the late 2008 or nine, after I did my stand-up special, I thought, God, what, um, you know, what's next? I knew I couldn't get on the talk shows if I was gay. They just said no blatantly to me. Hmm. They use those words. What year was this? Uh, 2004 is when I stopped pursuing them. Okay. Because one of the uh, bookers on The Tonight Show told me they're not going to have me on. Oh, two, three, wait, of The Tonight Show over the years. It just got to be, uh, oh, it was just so hard to hear that, that you couldn't compete in any way, shape, or form. Has that changed today? Oh, yeah. 
there are other comedians now that are getting and doing stand up on the show. So being on a talk show doing stand up is not such a big deal anymore. Okay. Because it doesn't change your career. People don't watch them in the numbers that they used to. My friend uh, Margaret Cho, uh, Drew Carey, uh, a couple people went on there and their whole lives changed the next day. Literally. So current projects. Talk, talk to me about Smothered. What's that I about? have my own series on Amazon and Reverie, which is a gay network. And Reverie has put it on Apple TV and Samsung and Gluch and Glock and Gluch and all those places. <laughs> so it's on all over the net. Uh, the website for the show is smotheredtv.com. It's a short form series and it's uh, co-wrote it. I co-star in it. I co-created it and co-produced it with this wonderfully talented man, uh, Mitch Hera. We play a couple who have been together for 30 years, who hate each other and can't afford to get divorced. It's a comedy drama. You can watch it on smothertv.com or you can go to Amazon. It's been very gratifying to be able to create a character and create something that people really dig so much. I was sort of, th I thought it was gonna be sort of a gay niche, but it seems like everybody seems to dig it. Uh, we just finished picture on post for the second season. Now we're working on the sound music and color correction show hopefully it will be out season two probably in march and okay. uh, amanda burse from married with children is in it ida rodriguez is in it from the from hbo special and jay rodriguez from queer eye and okay. so many bros and both of them are in bros uh amanda's in bros too and we have uh, armand friend from the new queerest folk we have the, the series is filled with probably 10 15 actors so you said you're the, a co-writer on that? I co-wrote well? it. I co-star okay. in it. And How do you come up with the ideas for that? Uh, we improvise them. And Mitch writes them down. Then he sends it to me. And then we both rewrite it. And then we read it. And then we rewrite it again. And then we rehearse it. And then we rewrite it again. And then we rehearse more. And we change things. And we rehearse more. And we add things. And then we go on the set. And we realize that we can't do... We can't get a prison, so we have to use a hallway <laughs> and decide how to that they're waiting. And we create behavior, and it's just some of my best work. I think I won the Indie Series Award for Best Actor in a Comedy, and I have to tell you, I was so moved. I could not believe it. It just uh, when I think about it, I just I think of all these uh, independent people who are these are my people. These are the indie people who make indie projects. And they, I don't think I just want it for that show. I think I want it for the body of my work, which even means more to me because they saw me, as Oprah said. People could see me. And a lot of times I have felt unseen because of the um, opportunities that I've not been able to have. And I understand that nobody promises you anything in this right. business, but I'm known as somebody who works hard. And also, it seems like you want to give back. You're involved in uh, LGBT, as far as actors, a group or something like that. I create, well, what's, what's that about? I created the Screen Actors Guild. I just had a meeting today. Okay. The Screen Actors Guild LGBTQ Committee. I'm okay. the national co-chair along with Tracy Godfrey. She came on a couple of years. I've been doing it for 17, 18 years now. I, I co-created it with Duncan Crabtree Island, who is now the head CEO of SAG-AFTRA, who's my friend. I called him... <laughs> I remember, and I didn't call him, I um, I sent faxes to Melissa Gilbert because she was the uh, president at the time from Little House on the Prairie, and nobody ever answered them. Because I thought, we we got to have an LGBTQ committee. There's a black committee, there's a woman's committee, there's a Latino com committee, there's all these committees, but there was no one for us. And I would go to Outfest and I'd meet all these actors and everybody was afraid. And this is when Grey's Anatomy, uh, when Isaiah Washington called... Um, Oh, what's the other actor's name? TJ, not TJ, uh, the, the gay actor. I forgot his name. Uh, I can see his face. And when they had this whole thing on the set, and called him the F word for gay people. I don't even like to say it. There was all this press about it. So I get a call from Duncan, and I he says I'm one of the I'm one of the head legal counsel. That's what he was at the time at SAG. And we, and I said, okay, now listen to me. I have this <laughs> film. And I've not received my residuals. And I, I thought it was the residual department because I had been trying to get, I had done a movie called A Day Without a Mexican. And they sold it to uh, another company in another country. And I wasn't receiving any residuals. And I called it for them. And I, it was, they were working on it for like a year and nothing happened. So I, I said, listen, what's going on there? And he says, Jason, we're not calling about that. <laughs> we're, we'd like to start the LGBTQ committee. And I went, oh my God, really? And it took a gay man, Duncan Crabtree Island, who has five children with his husband, 
five black children that he adopted, Anna Marie Johnson, a black woman, Sumi Haru, an Asian woman, God bless her, she passed away, and uh, Alan Rosenberg, who at that time, a Jewish man who was the president of the union to help create an LGBTQ committee in 2004. And we talked about it today, you know, what we've done and how things have changed. And I believe I've been a, you know, a small part of that. So that makes me feel good. What was the purpose of it? Why did you form that? Two reasons. To support my LGBTQ brothers and sisters, give them a place that's safe to talk about what's going on. And well, three things that, and then to make it sure that it's safe on a set for them, that you can't get fired for being gay like I was. Uh, you cannot be bullied or called names or made j jokes about you. And I would say the third thing was to create opportunity. That was my big thing, is to create opportunity. And that was, and that's still really important to me. So you mentioned to keep them from being harmed in a way. So do they have, is there some meat to it, some teeth? Oh yeah, so it's in it's in all our contracts now. Okay, it is. Okay. All the all the, we had nothing in our contracts about LGBTQ people. Okay. Now because of the committee, uh, the staff, Tracy, myself, and all the other people who have worked with us, everyone from we've had everybody from George to Kai is the probably been on the committee the longest and holds the record for never showing up. <laughs> but he let us use his name. Rosie O'Donnell's on the co uh, committee this year. Chaz Bono's been on. My friend Dalila Ali Raja is on. Um, so many wonderful people have come through for the last, you know, 17, 18 years. So it's been something I can do that. I've always felt the need to give back. I've always felt that I've coached actors for free for 20 years. Hmm. And I just started getting paid to do it. <laughs> Oh, wow. That's good. In, the, in COVID, I started doing that. Wow. People just kept asking me, and I thought, oh, well, it's, it's really fun. And I enjoy uh, sharing my experience, strength, and hope with people who need to be prodded or supported, or, or like they said in the play, orphans, given that extra squeeze right. on your shoulder of encouragement. Were you doing that teaching through Zoom or what? Yeah, always okay. through Zoom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You going to be doing any classes? I do, once a month, I'll speak at the Hollywood Winner's Circle. Wendy Elaine has this uh, wonderful group, and that's something I uh, do. But um, I mostly, you know, more so concentrate on my acting career, trying to get people that I want to work with to hire me, basically. Okay. <laughs> you know, and uh, doing stand-up occasionally. Yeah. And What's on the horizon? Have any other projects? Certainly Smothered Season 2. I have a movie coming out, I think in the summer, a little straight boy comedy called Garlic Parmesan. If you look, if you like Nick, uh, Napoleon Dynamite, you'll love this film. I was recently on the last season of Goliath. I played the head of a pharmaceutical company opposite J.K. Simmons. That's the Billy Bob Thornton series. So are you a bad guy in that? I play this guy trying to save ass which is really interesting and i it's a real grown-up part i play a real grown-up person and i my boss is two-time academy award nominee bruce dern oh yeah i'm in a scene with jk simmons who has an oscar Haley joe osmond plays uh, billy bob thornton's son he's in my scene he has an oscar nomination and i had my little indie series award. <laughs> i mean it's like oh my god i was nervous it was huh. they were quite uh, intimidating and I play a guy that's intimidated by him, but I have to hold my own and I have to give him some information that uh, he does not want to hear. And I know I'm going to fail, but it doesn't matter. I still have to stand up in front of him. And uh, it was quite uh, fun to watch me do that. When I saw it, I didn't know what it was going to look like. Is it fun doing this or is it work? Uh, sometimes it's fun and sometimes it's work. It depends. Okay. One day is harder to do when you're just doing one day on something. I think the the most fun I ever had on a set was doing the film, The Birth of a Nation. I played a white heterosexual Christian plantation owner in 1831, and that- You were out of character. Very much so. <laughs> a gay Jewish liberal man yeah. playing that. But really resonated for me was to be in a film about the first black abolitionist, Nat Turner, to be of support to my black brothers and sisters, to shut up and listen. And it changed me as a human, and it changed me as a man to know that where generational wealth came from. I never even thought about it until eight oh. years ago when I got cast in it. Never even really had that on my mind on how we got to where we go. And it really was is my dream to 
do films, to do television, to do theater, to, uh, of people who want to go in a room, watch something and be able to change how they think about something. Mm -hmm. That's really powerful to me. But I do still love doing stand-up. And I don't know when this is going to be out, but they can see all my dates coming up. I'm actually doing a really cool date on April 4th at the Throckmorton Theater in uh, Mill Valley, California, which is a really cool theater. And this is where Robin Williams used to live in that area. He used to do stand-up there. So that's really cool. And then I'm doing mostly the clubs around Los Angeles and stuff uh, um, and sets. And I'm doing this special called Out Proud. And it's July 1st at the Renberg Center. We're going to tape it in Los Angeles. And I'm going to be with all these LGBTQ comedians, which I have not done in the longest time to do a special with other comedians. I did the first group of specials that Comedy Central did called the Out There Specials. There was one from Hollywood, San Francisco, and New York. And I was the one from Hollywood. And that was... uh, 30 years ago. So this is sort of a 30 year anniversary wow. to doing wow. that again. And you live in Palm Springs? I live in Palm Springs around 75% of the time. When why, I'm did, why did you come here? I wanted a slower, easier, easier life. Were you in LA before that? Yeah. Exclusively? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But, I'm, but I'm, I'm not always home, so I don't live anywhere for a long amount of time. And I like to travel a bit, so. So you're putting a lot of miles on your car? Uh, Between oh, LA, yeah. LA and Palm Here Springs. and yeah. other places, yeah. Right. I'll be in Brea, I'll, I go, I mean, you know, Beaumont, I'm in all over the place. So I think I'm going to be doing the Portland Queer Comedy Festival oh, next, yeah? next year, this year rather. It is next year already. It's 23 already. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm going to be doing that. I haven't heard yet, but I was to- asked to be in it. I don't know if it's going to be, be uh, to fruition, but she's trying hard to make that happen. It's a wonderful comedy festival. I've done it before there, and it's, Portland's really cool. I love Portland. And your main website has links to all of these things you've mentioned jason stewart.com s-t-u-a-r-t tells everything all my social media videos clips press photos my my book my comedy cds you know all that kind of stuff i guess we haven't mentioned your book what's the name of it it's called shut up i'm talking (laughs) and guess who guess who named that book my mother your mother it was oh she said that to you yes it was supposed to be called uh, i'm not barbara streisand i wanted that to be the title because there's the the first story in in the book is called simply barbara and it's about seeing funny girl and how i've just felt like i was her and i thought oh my god you know, she's funny, just like me on the outside. She's sad, just like me on the inside. And she's Jewish and she looks like someone I grew up with and she's in love with men. I'm in love with men, but she's a woman. Oh my God, who am I? And they, the publisher called and said, you cannot use that name. She's got her own books coming out and her own things. She'll get sued. I said, great. And then he said, no, we can't do that. We're a small company. So I said, okay, I'll get another name. And I called my mom. I said, they won't let me use my name. What am I going to do? She says, I don't know. I said, mom, what should I do? She said, look, shut up. I'm talking. <laughs> she said that to you. Yeah. That. I thought, that's it. Oh, that's it. <laughs> it's an homage to the old Lenny Bruce joke. Right. You know, I didn't know I was five years old. My name wasn't shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it's very Jewish. Because some people find it a little, the, the title a little blunt, but that's the way I grew up. And it's oh. also symbolic to the way gay men are erased. You know, there's a certain, I think I've always been looking for my voice and just to be able to be myself without um, other people holding me back, which is something I am still working on. Well, I usually ask my guests a question before we finish. And that is, and you've already mentioned some of it already, but what are the main lessons of your life or things that you live by? Kindness is probably the most important thing okay. for me in friends and in lovers and in family, because I grew up with, in a very unkind family. And my, you know, this world is unkind at times. And the business that I'm in, um, doing things for others without expecting something in return, which is a hard thing. Being able to breathe, take a breath, be able to look at what you've done and go, okay, I wasn't so bad. And I think the most important thing is just to keep showing up. Like Jennifer Coolidge said, it's not over till you're dead. (laughs) Well, I have one last question for you. So when did you shave your head? I saw some earlier clips Uh, with hair. You look totally different. Always losing hair, always losing hair. Since I was in my late 20s, I think I... I think two, I did a movie called The Pit and the Pendulum and they wanted me to look sort of ugly and it wound up not being that way. And I uh, play the Vincent Price role, tick tock, tick tock, back and forth. It swings. And-
And uh, I shaved my head in 2008 or nine, and I never went back. Is that easier? Oh my God. <laughs> well, my, the, mine shaved as well. So all the things that I had to do and the right. money I had to spend and the hair pieces and Those the conditioner. things and the, oh, and, and the coloring <laughs> and I go, well, well, sir, thank you for coming in. This has been fun. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. And it, this episode will be out, I think toward the end of February. So it'll oh, be in time that some of the things that you already talked about, wonderful. They, can, they can check it out. Jason tells all. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.